We now move on to our keynote speaker, Dr. John Gatorna. Dr. Gatorna is executive chairman of Gatorna Alignment, a Sydney space specialist supply chain advisory firm. Thanks, Girish, and uh, thank you, uh, Rakish, for uh, your introductory comments. I think that uh, listening to what Rakish said yesterday and again this morning, I think he's on to something. I think that uh, India's really on the cusp. Well, I haven't been here for about three years. Um, I, I decided not to come back after the last time because uh, I just felt that there were too much there was too much low level thinking and we weren't getting the attention of, of serious senior executives but um, since Rakish has come back from the Middle East and been working here uh, in his unit I think uh, he's made a big impression and we're starting to get the attention of the right people because you know none of us live forever and I don't have a lot of time left on this earth so uh, I, I want to make sure that the messages that, that I bring, which have been developed over a long time, actually uh, hit the right places and hit the decision makers. Just a few comments before I show you a few slides. Um, the thing that's happening out there is it's all about speed, speed and more speed. And, you know, we're getting a huge disruption uh, we're seeing, you know, the events around the world. We're seeing Western governments, Australia, the U.S., the U.K., are very, uh, li very pathetic in their in the way that they're managing their, their, their not so much their own economies, but managing the relationships with the rest of their global partners. Um, uh, technology is going exponential, and it is both a disruptor and a solution. And we've got to be able to actually cope with the disruption, but also use it uh, in an aggressive way, opportunistically for our solutions. And the point is, supply chains are pervasive. They're omnipresent. They're everywhere. We can't see them, but every time we go to a supermarket, you know, and we pick something up, there it is. It's the end of the supply chain. My wife and my two boys, they have no idea what I do. And I try to explain to them that in those sorts of terms, that sitting behind the scene, we've got these incredible networks, uh, supply chains around the world. And, you know, we very nearly came close to absolute disaster in the global financial crisis because as we just about got to the point where banks around the world were, were not going to give credit to each other and allow credit be to pass in order for transactions to occur, we just about brought the global supply chains to a halt. And if that had happened, that would have been absolutely catastrophic. So now is the time to start thinking about transforming your business and to get ahead of the tsunami of disruption and uh, uncertainty that's coming. Uh, the world is, is uh, the new reality of the world is volatility. Um, I think. One of the advantages in India, I think, Rakesh, is that you uh, haven't gone too far down the, the, the route and as a late comer into the supply chain uh, area. Uh, you can benefit by looking at what other people have done, the mistakes they've made, and you can leapfrog. You, there's no need for you to go through the same pain that we've gone through in Europe and Australia and the US in learning our way through the last 30 or 40 years. You can leapfrog. So the sort of messages I want to bring to you today are these. Supply chain, what we have to do, we've, do, we've heard about the macro view of what's happening across the world in trade flows and geographies. Well, I wanted to say a few words to you today is drop down to the corporate level because the corporate level and our supply chains associated with the multinational companies in this room, they are the building blocks that then build up to that and aggregate to that sort of trade. And the number one thing that I am sort of saying to people for now, we've got to increase the level of rhythm in our businesses. Uh, Charles Fine used the term 20 years ago, but he really couldn't go very far because we didn't have digitization. But clock speed is the name of the game. We've got to start getting the revolutions in our business in the way that we uh, make decisions and the way we get product out from raw material into the hands of our users, we've got to start going away from, say, a rhythm of four times a year, which may be 
measured in, say, Stockton, to it maybe 15 or 20 times a year. We're seeing it in fashion companies and high-tech companies now, and the great advantage of that is that once you lift the game and you're making faster decisions and you're getting product out, you don't need as much inventory. And secondly, you can cope with volatility. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. And I think the other thing that I'd like, I'm trying to give you a couple of words to latch on to. The other word is precision. It's not a word that you'd probably heard of in the context of supply chain, but I think we've got to be a lot more precise in what we're doing. Because as indicated by Rakish and others, you know, we're in a world of, of, of restricted resources now. The world is finite. And, and so we've got to get rid of the over-servicing that we've been doing. We've got to start to be more precise in the way we deliver our value propositions to our customers. And in a sense, that's what my whole alignment idea has been about. And all of those two things add up to transformation. So really what I'm saying, saying to you is the name of the game is let's get started on transforming our businesses starting from where we are but taking a view of where we want to go so that we've got the two endpoints in mind because once we get the two endpoints, the start point and where we want to take our individual companies and of course India as an aggregate of that, we can start precisely charting our course. So my whole thrust actually in the last couple of years of going forward is about um, uh, not just you know, activity-based uh, stuff. It's about precisely thinking about how to transform our businesses. And, you know, these are the sorts of things, you know, we've got uh, uh, omni-channels are coming forward. We've got, I know, um, Reliance in the room. Uh, I think it's a big challenge because omni-channels are really about integrated channels. It's about retailers being able to have several channels to allow customers to access any one of those and having them connected so that we know a customer that comes on that channel is bought on another channel at another time. Those are the sorts of things we've got to know. Um, disintermediation is happening um, through blockchain. It's coming whether you like it or not. Sustainability is coming back. People like Trump and our own Prime Minister don't, doesn't believe in sustainability. It's coming, whether they like it or not. The major corporations are getting serious again about that because they understand the restrictions uh, on resources. Social license to operate uh, would be very important to India where companies coming in and putting initiatives together have got to convince the stakeholders that this is a good thing for the stakeholders. So social license to operate is a new emerging issue that hasn't hitherto been there. Of course, you never see that in China because they don't take those sort of things into account. And they'll have their day. Every dog has his day. It comes back to bite you if you don't take into account the sort of stakeholders uh, in the long term. Geographical shifts, as we heard, increasing regularly. And then, of course, we've got to build capabilities over here, a lot of which are systems capabilities, but a lot of which, of course, are human capabilities. So. The world that we live in today is this one. It, this is the world we've inherited uh, from, from the British, largely. Uh, you inherited railways from them as well and a bit of bureaucracy, but they also gave us these sorts of uh, the industrial revolution and these sorts of structures in our organisation design. This structure has had its use by date. You know, the reality is that that... For the last 200 years, we've developed these sort of vertical functions and because it's easier to manage that way and even though we've been, the supply chains flow horizontally and we got away with it. But since the coming of the internet and, and the sort of uh, omnipresence of that and the ability to connect with each other one to one, you know, customers out here, the expectations you as individuals buying online, take that expectation into your business and you start to expect dealing in your business in the same way and getting deliveries in a day or two days or three days instead of two weeks, three weeks a month. And so the build-up on the right of expectations of customers 
is forcing as a backwash us to rethink how we organise ourselves. And one of the problems we have, it's not a technical problem at all, it's a, it's a leadership problem, is that we have an organisation design problem here where we are managing our businesses vertically but our supply chains are horizontal. We are 90 degrees out of phase from the day we walk, from the minute we walk into the office in the morning. 90 degrees out of phase. And then we spend the rest of the time in crisis. So we, we've got to start, I've been putting a lot of thought into how can we, you know, change, how can we keep, maintain our vertical specialisms, but we can start to build um, clusters on the, on the left there to drive the supply chains from the supply side through. And that's where I've used my own uh, thinking here, the dynamic alignment thinking, which I'll come back to in a moment, but it, 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 it acts as a bit of a heuristic to sort of help us sort out what's going on in our marketplace and what's going on in our supply base. Because, and here's the world we want to get to. Someone was telling me yesterday, the world, I think it was the, uh, uh, the, um, the world of five. Everything happens in fives or fours. Um, and it's so here that what we've now done is taken this, this segment of our customer base and we've come down here and after 20 years of work in the field, we've actually observed patterns that allow us to understand now that in any market, I don't care what it is, airlines, tickets, uh, um, insurance, chemicals, FMCG, anywhere where human beings are buying stuff, there are four or five dominant se segments that will give you about an 80% coverage of the market. There are 16 different buying behaviours we've identified in the marketplace, but never, you don't need 16, there's always five dominant ones, not always the same five. And once you know that, you can reverse engineer back through your business very precisely, putting together teams, putting together the appropriate KPIs, the appropriate training and development, the appropriate technology combinations, and you can go out the back end and you can start looking at your supply base in a much more considered way, looking for those suppliers that are loyal, those suppliers who have got the ability to give you low unit cost, those suppliers who can give you replenishment on a quick, you know, quick response basis, those suppliers who have got creativity that will help you in times of need. And so, you know, this idea of having the qualitative work, and this is all supported, you know, quite apart from market research, through the analytics and the collection of data now that we can collect and, and analyse and look for patterns through using clever statistical techniques like coefficient of variation where you can see patterns in the data. And so that is the world that we're, we're moving into. Now, all that is all very well, but we come to the idea of speed. And if you think of an organisation where, uh, or, or outside in the world, everything has a natural frequency. This device I've got in my hand's got a natural frequency. That table's got a natural frequency. So out in the world, people who are buying whatever they're buying, there's a natural sort of frequency that they use. And if you are an organisation over here where you're actually in sync with that, that's great. But you know, if you're in a situation where the natural frequency or response time inside your organisation is less, the cycle is less than the natural frequency of demand coming from the other side, you're going to be continually conflicted and misaligned. On the other hand, if you have the ability to start in, in increasing the, the, the natural frequency through faster decision making, better quality decision making, using technology, uh, modelling techniques, uh, getting better quality uh, executives all th and, and getting executives who are prepared to make decisions, not go into committee over every, everything, uh, then you will end up where you get ahead of the market and you will start to absolutely absorb any additional volatility that happens in the marketplace. So that idea of increasing clock speed is, is an overlay everything that I'll just say here about alignment and the alignment is about this idea of being precise and the idea of the alignment is this, that some of you would have seen it before and I apologise uh, 
for those who were here yesterday, but I can assure you that every time you hear me speak about this, you'll probably something little, extra little uh, gem will drop, you know, and you'll understand it better because it's, it's not an easy concept. But essentially, it's easy when you say it, but that everything, if, if you can get these four things to line up and work, and it's difficult to line up because they're moving. Everything's moving. The marketplace is moving. Customers within that marketplace are, are under pressure. Uh, but we need to understand what the fundamentals are. And the fundamental in any business is what are the expectations of our, of our marketplace and can we come up with a, a, a small number of expectations because the idea of one size fits all is dead. I can tell you, forget it. Because it leads to over and under servicing, neither of which is any good. And, and if you can understand what we did, we came up with four or five different segments to give you an 80% uh, uh, fit to the market. Then it's easy to develop value propositions and strategies. And then you go down inside the organization and instead of having a higgledy-piggledy culture where people are just thrown together and given tasks, you start putting together subcultures, a subculture of relationships to support the the, the, the collaborative customers you've got out there, a subculture of cost to support those that you, who, who are looking for a lean uh, supply chain, a subculture of speed where people take individual responsibility and risk for those, those supply chains which have to be agile. They don't, agility doesn't happen by accident. It has to be engineered. And so we start to have to re-engineer, genetically engineer the people in our organisation. And the great thing is most of the people in our organisations are, are what we want. We don't just get rid of them and get a new batch. We look at each individual's strengths and try to put them in teams where, you know, they will work best for us. And organisations like Spotify and Zara and Adidas and Lee and Fung in Asia are doing that. You know, it, this is not rocket science. People with great leadership have been doing it. And, of course, below that, this word leadership is fundamental. If there's one word that I, I, I want to reinforce to you today, and that is you have to become leaders. I know you've got a great government at the moment in India doing great things, but don't wait around for them. In Australia, we haven't got a great government, so, you know, we, we're having to get, you know, business and commerce up and leading until we can get governments to catch up. So the idea is if we can get those things lined up, uh, we're going to get an ongoing performance. And it's called outside in. You know, the problem is for the last 50 years, supply chain only became a management science, a field of management science at about 1963. I got into it in 1975, so about 12, 13 years later. But in the, for the last 50 years, we've been building our supply chains on an inside out basis. What I mean by that is we sit here in the business, we take a view of what we think customers are telling us, we listen to all this mumbo jumbo from NPS surveys and net, net promoter score surveys which give us opinions and, and reflections about what customers are telling us at a point in time which may or may not be there next week. We haven't done the work to understand but what are the basic expectations that don't change? People's values don't change. They can change their behaviour under pressure from time to time. So someone who's a loyal customer may become a cost-conscious customer if a CFO comes in and tells them they've got to take 10% out of the budget. But when he's gone, this guy will sit back and come, become a loyal customer again. So that's the other thing that I think has completely um, mystified people who have tried to design supply chains. They've tried to design a static supply chain and create flexibility when they saw the customer moving around, but all that's done is created exceptions and cost. What I want you to do is start thinking about creating or hardwiring your business with four or five different configurations, and then we can just pull the trigger on any of those as the customers float up and down in front of us. So you can get flexibility and flex without the added cost. So these are the things and what, you know, I was reflecting on this morning when, when 
Rakesh was talking and Giris was talking and, you know, there's been some great people in history and you've had a few uh, in India, of course, great men. Uh, but one of the great men of the last century has been Mandela from South Africa. And it, it, in my next book, I, I've picked up a great quote from him and he talks about this idea of language. You know, he was saying we are... We, we, we have many different languages, but this is what you've got in India as well, but we are really one people. But the problem is because we have different languages, we don't communicate. And that's the problem we've got inside our corporations. I'm an engineer, and one of the things that I know as an engineer is you can't compare things that don't have the same metric. If you've got yards and metres and cubic feet and blah, 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 you can't compare anything. You've got to reduce things that you're trying to work on to the same metric. And so inside our business, we've got people who are just talking different languages, marketing people talking mumbo-jumbo about market share and brand and pricing strategy. And we've got procurement people who are talking about, I don't know, what do they talk about? Um, sourcing and strategic sourcing and screwing suppliers and rationalising product ranges. You know, it's got nothing to do with anything. And all the universities are exacerbating this because they're giving all our students all this stuff, none of which connects. And when we go inside organisations, we are just like foreigners. And then we, re we try to connect with customers who are on the outside of the business and we've got no chance. So we go into the guessing game and we try something and we find it fail. We put the DC in the wrong place or the manufacturing in the wrong place or we launch the wrong products and we screw up all this technology and we put people out of work because of our, our mistakes. That's because it's a language problem. What we've discovered is a behavioural metric that we can measure our customer expectations, we can measure the internal culture in our businesses and we can measure the leadership style using the same coding method and we can use that same coding method to describe strategy. So in the alignment, we can actually now look at our entire market and we can look back to our supply base in the same way, using the same metric, and as soon as we've got that, we can see precisely where the misalignments are and we can start to make you know, the, 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 the necessary changes. So... Here we are, we've got customers on the right creating these different patterns. We don't see these patterns because they're all mixed up, but the, the, the new analytics capabilities that we've got and the methodologies we've got are really important because we can start to pull out what these look like and we can start measuring, uh, managing them separately. The bottom two are pretty, you know, pretty much base load. And what we've discovered, and I'm sure it's the same in your business, is that most businesses have got some base load, 30 to 40% of your volume, maybe 50%, and the rest is volatility. Now, when you mix the two together, you can't manage it. If you separate them out because you recognise which customers are, are, are behaving in certain ways, you can manage the base load using lean, predictable principles, and you can use the, vol the, the volatile demand can be, can be managed in different ways where you, you look at capacity and you, you, know, you actually charge premiums if, you, if necessary. So really, this is the key metaphor that I wanted you to see um, because it's, it's quite different to what the Americans were talking about some years ago. They never quite got the behavioural bit. I remember when I launched my first book back, Paul, in 2010, and I went to America and did a big tour, um, and, it, and the, the, the cover of it was called Living Supply Chain. Some of you may remember it. And most of the big companies I went to, the, the, the A-list companies in America, said, well, what are you talking about? What's living got to do with supply chain? They had no idea. They said, technology will save us. Well, we know it won't save us. It is the combination of technology and our understanding of the behavioural aspects at both ends of our supply chain and the internal culture and the way people behave is really the key. It's that interface. 
And my new mantra is think customer, act digital. And that interface between the, the customer thinking, the behavioural thinking and the digitisation, it's a crucial interface that we haven't totally resolved yet. But that is the challenge and I think if we can work on that, we will go a long way. And what we're showing here is five uh, conveyor belts, all with the same product on them, same product, but it's been delivered differently, it's got different packaging, it's priced differently, because the customers at that end want to buy it in a different way. It's not about different products going down, commodity products going down lean supply chains and novelty products going down agile supply chains at all. That is rubbish. So we get to a stage where, you know, we've got our, on the right hand side, our customers pulling the product through, we've got our suppliers with capabilities on the left, we've got our functions in the vertical here inside the business and we've got clusters of people. If you go across to Hong Kong and Paul Paul Bradley knows this and he worked in it. You go and see Lee and Fung, they're having to reinvent their model. It's been very successful, but you know, nonetheless, no model lasts forever. But they've got clusters of 30 and 40, 50 people who are multidisciplinary, who are focused on their customers and who are then going back into China and placing orders on manufacturing and looking at the quality control and organising the logistics. The only problem with Lee and Fung is they went too far. They developed too many clusters and the clusters went feral and they started to compete with each other for capacity in China's manufacturing location. So, you know, and, and by the way, you don't have to have all those. You might find in your business that you've got lean and, and agile, maybe your, your key um, uh, supply side supply chains and on the front end it may be agile and lean as well. So you don't have to have five by five, but it's just these are the possibilities. And as we move on, and this is, I'm going to stop very soon, I can't, I can't stress enough the importance of you starting to understand more about the culture. And I'm not talking about Indian culture. Country cultures do have an impact on the way multinationals in particular operate. You have McDonald's in, in here in, in, in India, it will operate a little bit differently, to oper uh, but essentially the, 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 the company culture will be the same, but the, the country culture has a modifying effect because of the norms, etc. I'm not going to talk about that, but what I will say is that unless you start getting your little subcultures inside your business supporting the strategies that you're trying to drive into those four or five segments, if you, you will get misalignments which will create a lot of spinning wheels. And that is what's hurting us most. It's not competitors. For God's sake, don't worry about competitors. I think competitive analysis is useful stuff, but it's not as important as understanding. If we'd spend as much money trying to understand the forces of darkness inside our own businesses and rooting out the resistors, we would have achieved a lot more implementation success than we have ever done. And my uh, uh, work has shown that between 40 and 60% of the, of the business plans we write never get delivered, not because of competitors, but because of the internal resistance from people inside the business who say, yeah, 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 but deep down are saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So there's a lot to be done here in this area and it's just emerging as we start to connect all the work in psychology back to and, in, and apply it in our businesses. Now, I'm not going to go through it, but essentially, you know, we've got these different subcultures, the entrepreneurial subculture, the hierarchical subculture, the subculture of speed, the subculture of relationships. We need them all. Why? Because the subcultures in the marketplace are there. We call them behavioural segments. And so what we're trying to do inside our business is have the same subcultures as a mirror image that we see on the outside and connect the two with a thing called strategy. And of course leadership eventually nothing happens and the great 
companies that I've wa looked at over the years, and they, they make money and they perform through, irrespective of the trading environment, are those where the, the leadership understand their marketplace. You've got to have those two things right. Then there's a good chance that the strategies that you put in place and the, and the, and the cultures that you put in place, which are derived, will work. So the point I just made, transformation, number one barrier, guess what? It's the culture. It's the culture, stupid. It gets, it gets us every time. And you know what? And this, is, this is, I feel ashamed to say this. I've taught around the world at the best business schools. No one teaches this stuff. If you want to learn about culture, you go and do a degree in psychology. But does anyone connect the psychology with what's happening in business? Our business schools are not doing the job. They're not doing it in India. They're not doing it in the US. They're not doing it in Australia. They're too insular. They're too driven by vertical specialisms. They still haven't got it. And they've got to step up. And in the meantime, we need businesses like you to take on board interns and give them a better education. And you know, finally, the practical barrier for everything I've said today. Has anyone thought about that? Master data. Think about your own business. Who's in charge of keeping the master data files up to date? Have you ever tried to build a network model? Have you ever tried to make decisions? Have you tried to put in uh, digitization when your master data file is crap? You won't get anywhere. And so what I'm suggesting, and I've said it to the companies that listen to me, like Snyder Electric and Unilever, get some people in on that and start you know, getting it right, sorting out the rubbish in the ERP files and the transactional files. You've got to have that right. Build data warehouses and then start to extract the, the clean data from there to, to make the decisions because I come back to the earlier point. Everything from now on is going to be about outs, outflanking your competitors. This idea of the OODA loop, if you've ever heard of that, developed by the Americans during the Korean War where a lot of their planes were being shot down by the Chinese, Chinese pilots and North Korean pilots. And they went and they looked at this and they realized that they needed a methodology to make quicker decisions and make decisions quicker than the other pilots, which they did. They found the methodology and they started shooting the other plane down. And it's the same in business. If you can out-decision your competitors, and, and you're going to satisfy your customers, you're going to save resources, you're going to be sustainable, you're going to be precise, and you're going to perform very well. And so my last point here is, as you think about your business, don't get everything mixed up and throw everything up in the air. Look at your business in two ways. Maintain the business as usual, Keep people focused on today's business, but start a group of people over here who can start exploring the, 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 uh, uh, the new developments, which then ultimately then get fed back into business as usual as you go forward. So um, the, 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 the world is very much about these two sides, the incrementally evolutionary side of your business, maintaining the business as usual, but you must continue to do some work over here, developing innovation, keeping that team separate from the business as usual team, and then as things become to the point where they're developed enough, you feed that back in and it becomes business as usual. If you do that and you keep doing that, you will be successful. So I look forward to coming back uh, in a year or so and, and seeing how much that you've done going forward and I hope that I can I can see a, 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 a real physical improvement and, and, a, and a, if you like that, that senior management we've got their attention because this is not a supply chain problem this is a business enterprise problem it involves all of us thank you very much